Hello and welcome to lecture 6 for the course ECE 257A, Fault Tolerant Computing. Uh, this lecture deals with, uh, as you see on the slide, defect circumvention, uh, some general methods, and then some specific examples in chapter 8 of the textbook. So as the name implies, the defect circumvention basically is based on uh, detecting the defects and circumventing their effects, getting around them uh, by sort of ignoring the defects and not using the parts that are defective. <clears throat> there are actually two uh, complementary methods of defect circumvention. Either one or both of them can be used in a specific context. Uh, defect circumvention by removal requires that we have built-in dynamic redundancy on the die or wafer. Uh, identify the defective parts. Uh, this is done either by visual inspection when the defects are large, or testing, or association. Association means basically uh, you, you observe some effects that are associated with defects, and therefore you conclude that there are some defects. It's sort of like uh, uh, diagnosing a disease by its symptoms. And then we bypass the defect or reconfigure the system through embedded switches that have been provided on the chip. Okay, we'll see examples of these. Defect circumvention by masking, on the other hand, requires the provision of what we call static redundancy. <clears throat> Uh, static redundancy is when redundancy is built in and part of the normal operation of the system, except that when something goes wrong, that built-in redundancy automatically uh, kicks in and uh, prevents undesirable effects from happening. If you will, you know, defect circumvention by removal can be likened to error detecting codes. So you detect that something went wrong, but then you have to say, take some action to uh, correct the error or remove the uh, undesirable effects of that error. Defect circumvention by masking is sort of like error correcting codes, where the redundancy is built in and it just you know kicks in and you correct. There's no reconfiguration involved. Generally speaking, static redundancy requires higher levels of redundancy. So it's more expensive in terms of <clears throat> circuit cost and also in terms of power consumption. Uh, Sometimes we do some adjustment of the redundant structures once we detect the defects, but this is optional. It's not required. The system can continue operation with the defective parts because there is enough redundancy to nullify the effect of those defective parts. Now, given that removal of defects implies lower redundancy, and therefore lower circuit costs and lower energy costs, uh, these methods are more popular in integrated circuits. <clears throat> okay, so detection of defects, uh, one example is using visual or optical inspection on wafers after they're constructed. So basically a specialist will look at this wafer focusing in particular on areas that are more likely to have defects, like the edges of the wafer. And some uh, big defects, serious defects, can be detected by visual inspection. 
You can also use optical inspection that when uh, light is sh uh, sh shined on the wafer and the reflection of the light is examined to see if it is according to our expectation. So that's obviously more accurate uh, in uh, more likely to actually catch the defect because even tiny defects will have will change the optical characteristics enough for us to be able to detect them. Now using redundancy and reconfiguration uh, on a chip uh, works best when the system has a regular structure. And examples of such systems are memory, FPGA, multi-core chip, or chip multiprocessor. This is sort of like multi-core chip, except that uh, the chips, the, the cores on the chip are, can, are work together as a multiprocessor rather than just as individual cores. Irregular or random logic implies, requires greater level of redundancy uh, because basically we have no option but just to duplicate or replicate the structures. And we, when we replicate the structures, we have to take care that they're not too close. The replication is not too close to each other on the chip, the replicated unit, so that a single effect in one area of the chip does not affect both the original unit and the replicated versions. On the other hand, if you put these units far apart on the chip, it becomes harder to, for one to replace a defective one when it's far away because then wiring and switching overhead will be pretty large. So it's a tricky balance uh, to put them just far enough from each other so that a defect does not affect multiple units and not too far so that switching and wiring costs are not prohibitive. Now, avoiding bad sectors on a disk uh, memory uh, is a good example of defect circumvention by removal. So what happens, uh, disks use very strong error uh, correcting codes, um, actually a combination of error correcting and error detecting code. And then when we uh, find out through those codes that a particular sector on the disk sector is just a chunk of the disk surface that stores a block of information. When a sector is uh, judged to be bad, we no longer record data in that sector because uh, the probability of getting incorrect data will, will be high. So we remap that sector to a different area of the disk. So disk addressing typically says, okay, give me sector so-and-so. That sector so-and-so, that's a, a logical or virtual address. Physically on the disk, it can be located anywhere. So by relocating sectors, we can circumvent the effect of a bad sector. So in this diagram, you see that uh, we have two maps or tables. One is called plist permanent or primary defect table. The one is called G-list, which is the growth or post-use defect table. Uh, the primary defect table is set up by the disk manufacturer. So when the disk is manufactured and undergoes tests, some sectors are found to be uh, defective. They don't store information correctly. They're not reliable. So the manufacturer simply bypasses those sectors, circumvents those sectors. And there's a table that says where the new location of those sectors are, a mapping table. <clears throat> okay, so the net effect of the, these remapped sectors is that first of all, the disk capacity is reduced. 
because some sectors are not available. But the P list does not affect the nominal capacity of the disk. So if you buy a disk drive and it says it's a one terabyte drive, it really will have one terabyte of capacity, uh, even though some of the sectors are bad. This is because they actually built the disks to be slightly larger so that after removing and remapping those bad sectors, it still has the nominal or advertised capacity. So the peeless sectors do not affect the disk capacity. They do not affect the advertised disk performance either because the manufacturer makes sure that the disk still performs according to uh, specs in terms of data transfer rate, latency, and so on. So if it doesn't meet those specs, then the entire unit will be discarded and will not be shipped to the customer. So p -less is actually something that is hidden and we don't really notice it. Uh, it it's something that the manufacturer of the disk sets up and ensures that the disk can still operate under its normal parameters, capacity, uh, access speed, uh, data transfer rate, and so on. A G list is a list of sectors that are detected to be bad after the disk has been shipped. So this is part of the basically the disk drive software that detects that sectors, a particular sector has gone bad. Uh, for example, because an error was detected or the error correcting code basically kicks in too many times. Every time you read from that sector, the error correcting code has to make correction. Um, it's safer to just not use the sector because if something else goes wrong, then the capability of the error correcting code can be exceeded, not be able to correct it. So once we see that errors are corrected too often for a particular sector, then we just uh, circumvent that sector and record its new position uh, in this GList table. Now, as the GList grows, the disk capacity will be reduced. And this is something that will be observable because the disk capacity will go under the nominal or advertised capacity. Uh, performance will be affected too because locations of sectors do affect how fast you can get to them. So for example, if you have stored a file on consecutive sectors, then uh, it can be faster to read that file than if these sectors of the file were at random locations. Now, if one of those sectors goes bad and you remap it to a different location on the disk, then access to that file can slow down because now you have to access maybe two different tracks on the disk to, to read that file or write that file. Okay? So the growth of GList affects both the disk capacity and the disk performance. And once the GLIS becomes too large, the performance therefore is deteriorated by too much, you may want to discard the list altogether and switch to a new disk. And these days, disks are not expensive, so this can be easily done. You simply have to transfer the data from the disk to a different fresh disk and uh, start using that one. Now, for memory arrays over the years, many different techniques of defect circumvention, circumvention have been developed. And this is uh, this diagram shows one method where the memory array is supplied with spare rows and often also spare columns. <clears throat> okay, so let's ignore the spare columns for now. Let's, let's pretend they do not exist there. So we have spare rows, and within the memory array, a particular row becomes defective. Either the entire row is defective, 
where some cells, memory cells in that row become defective. And we don't have obviously the capability to replace individual memory cells. So we have to replace the entire row containing the defect. And that uh, replacement is accomplished through the decoding mechanism here. So normally if you say I want row, let's say it's maybe row 100. Row 100, the decoder detects it and selects this row for access. Now if that row becomes defective, then row 100 must be mapped to here, one of the spare rows. And therefore the decoding logic must be provided with this capability of mapping a particular row to a different location. So it is more complicated than normal decoder. Now, if this can be accomplished, and if you have M rows and S spares, and assuming that all the peripheral logic and decoders are perfectly reliable, that, that's a you know questionable assumption, but let's for simplicity assume that. Then if any M of the total M plus S rows are good, then the system is good. So you can model this as an M out of M plus S system. And of course, if you have a failure rate for the prefer peripheral logic, then you simply multiply that by whatever reliability you get from this M out of M plus S system. And the hope is that that reliability will be high enough so that it, the reliability does not deteriorate by too much. Now, if you have spare columns as well, then if you have a failed column, you can replace it with this column. Okay. <clears throat> Notice that if all the entire column has failed, every cell in this column has failed, then spare rows will not be of much use because you only have a small number of spare rows. And here you may have a large number of cells that are defective. So spare columns are actually useful because defects that are clustered along the column are more readily circumvented with spare columns. If defects are clustered along the row, then they are more readily uh, circumvented by using spare rows. Defect in logic uh, and FGA is a subject of this section of the textbook. Now, uh, circumventing defects in logic has a long history. Actually, in the 1950s, Moore and Shannon had this pioneering uh, paper idea uh, for building arbitrarily reliable relay circuits out of what they called crummy relays highly unreliable relays. Okay, so let's let's see how this works. Let's say the probability that the relay device closes when it's supposed to be open is P. So this is sort of like the failure probability. The relay must be open, but it closes. So here I've shown a bunch of relays. This relay is open, but it may be defective so that it closes with probability P when it's supposed to be open. When the, all these, so this is a redundant arrangement. Instead of one relay, I've used four relays, all controlled by the signal X. When X is asserted, the relay closes. It's a normal functioning. But under this scenario of defects, the relay, relay can close while x is equal to 0 is not asserted. OK, so if x is 0, we expect the circuit from left to right to be open. In other words, current should not flow, and it won't flow because all four relays are open. <clears throat> now, if one of these relays is defective and closes, then we still don't have current flowing from 
this side to this side because the other three relays being open stop the flow of current. Okay, however, if you have two defects, for example, the top two relays being both defective and closing when they should not, or this top left and bottom right relay closing, there are actually four combinations of double failures. The two bottom ones closing and the bottom left and top right closing. And it's easy to establish that the reliability of this redundant relay circuit is given by this equation. Our 4 port P squared is basically those four combinations of two relays being defective. But then when you count these two being defective and these two being defective as separate events, P squared and P squared, you're double counting the case where all three of these are defective, okay? Now, for any relay structure such as this, we can compute H of P, which is the probability that the structure as a whole closes when it's supposed to be open. And if this H of P is less than P, in other words, the probability of this structure misbehaving is less than the probability of a single relay misbehaving, then as soon as you get that, then recursively you can use this method many times to get the reliability as high as you want. Of course, in general, this is not very practical. So this arrangement of four relays gives you a better defect probability, a smaller defect probability. So repeat this four times. Okay, so replace each of these relays with this structure. So you now have 16 relays whose H function is even smaller than this H of P. And you can continue this. So this is basically what they meant by building arbitrarily reliable relay circuits out of crummy relays. Okay, now for this particular equation, we can easily establish that H of P is less than P if P is less than 0.382. So this is the curve of H of P. As long as P is less than 0.382, H of P will be less. In fact, it will be much less if P is very small, which is the normal expected condition. If P is very small, then this structure will be, may be reliable enough so that we use it. We don't have to recurse multiple times. But this is what they also mean by crummy. All you have to have for this method to be applicable for the failure probability to be less than 0.382 defect probability, and that's a pretty large number, you know, so even about 38% of the defect uh, rate of a relay is 38%, you can still gain by using this method. But of course, in practice, it's not 38%, maybe it's 1% or even less, and therefore you get significantly better uh, lower defect probability for this structure compared with a single relay. Now, of course, relays are old technology, but now uh, with CMOS uh, integrated circuit, this type of switches are really commonly used in ICs. So these methods have again become applicable, not for relays, but for uh, CMOS transistor switches. FPGAs, of course, they are ideally equipped for defect circumvention. Uh, so when you build this FPGA and this particular logic block is discovered to be defective, you simply declare it unavailable. And normally, the tools that you use to map designs onto FPGAs have this capability of not using 
a particular logic block or some particular interconnects because you need those you know sometimes you put multiple circuits on the same FPGA so once you have put one circuit on the FPGA one design then some of these configurable logic blocks have been used some of the interconnects have been used and therefore the design tool that puts the next design on, uh, on the FPGA should avoid those okay so this is built into the design tool therefore if now this one is not available because of defects it can be very easily circumvented in the mapping mapping process okay Th these are examples of uh, uh, one particular example of switches so when you have these connections uh, there is a switch box here that allows you to do flexible connections between incoming and outgoing lines so that you can establish a path maybe from this block through this line through this line through this line to this block so this switch box is programmable and this is an example so you have this is different from what you see down here. There are three vertical channels, three horizontal channels, and three switch boxes allowing you to connect between horizontal and vertical channel. And possible connections are straight through, straight through, uh, turn. This is a left going from up to here is a left turn, a right turn, and similarly for the other connections. So you can do a left turn, establish this connection, make a right turn, establish this connection, and so on. So you can establish the desired paths through these channels. And again, if a particular channel is not available, so for example, this horizontal channel over here is defective, then this switch will simply just be set to this state where it never uh, causes the signal to turn onto that channel. <clears throat> Multicore chips also have a natural uh, bypassing or circumvention ca capability. So for example, if you want to build an eight core chip, typically we build a chip with more cores than we need so maybe 10 cores and then if one or two of the cores are defective are found to be defective upon testing then we simply don't use them so if this connection the thing that connects the cores together is a bus then simply isolating those two units does the trick the other ones can still work if this is an interconnection network, then it becomes more tricky to uh, sort of <clears throat> avoid the effects of these bad cores and make sure that the other, the other cores still have uh, flexible connections through this interconnection network. So we have to design the interconnection network to allow that degradation with this particular port not used and this particular port is not used. <clears throat> so uh, one way to arrange these cores or any number of processing cells on a chip is to build arrays, one or two dimensional arrays. So here I'm con contrasting having four cores on a chip or four processors or sometimes we call these processing elements. Four of these on a chip, each of them is basically an independent unit with its own input output connections. So we use them as four independent units, except they happen to be on the same chip. 
<clears throat> okay, this is not very practical because nowadays processors have a lot of I.O. connections. So if so much so that even on a single processor chip, sometimes the number of pins become a limit on uh, using the chip. So we don't run out of uh, area to build a more complicated processor on the chip. We usually run out of pins to be able to feed that processor from outside. So we will be, if we adopt this strategy, we'll be forced to have very narrow channels. So instead of maybe 16, 32-bit channels connecting in, we may have 8-bit or 4-bit channels in order to limit the total number of pins. Uh, this has been more popular nowadays to connect the processors on the chip in this case as a 2D array, so that the number of I.O. pins will be reduced. So basically these two set of links and these two and these two and these two are eliminated because so now we have fewer pins or connections per processor, but we also have less flexibility. In other words, if this processor becomes defective, then it may not be a trivial matter to allow the other three processors <clears throat> to continue functioning because this processor is sort of uh, was being counted upon to supply data to this and this processor. You may be able to use the chip with degraded performance if this one is not available. But we better think of this possibility ahead of time and design the interconnection in the chip in such a way that one or two or three effective cells or processors do not cause all the other ones from becoming uh, ineffective or have such low performance that uh, they're practically of no use. So here is one such strategy. If I'm trying to build maybe a five by five array, I built a larger array. So basically I have spare rows and spare columns, extra rows and extra columns. And now if I have defective areas on the chip, this is a large defect that has disabled four of my processors. Now this blob is another defect that has disabled two of the processors. Meanwhile, by providing these alternate connections, I'm able to reconfigure the chip so that I still have one, two, three, four, and five, and six columns of processors except they are no longer connected in straight up and down columns, but, <coughs> but I've reconfigured the chip so that the column is made of this processor, this one, this one, this one, and so on. And similarly for rows. This row is intact, this row is intact, but this row is shifted down here to avoid that, that defective area. Okay, so I've sort of salvaged a five row by six column array that can do its job like a five by six unaffected array, despite the presence of these defects. Okay, so the next few slides basically talk about this arrangement. In order to allow this kind of reconfiguration, one way is to use this kind of switches that you see here. These are four port switches, okay, that can connect the ports in two schemes. This one we call the bent scheme, and this one we call the crossed. So the bent state and crossed state, there are two states, 
of this switch. Now given the, such switches, I can build a one-dimensional array in which I can bypass. So I can provide a spare, and then when something, one of the processors become defective, either at the time of manufacture or during operation, I can bypass it. How do I bypass it? Well, this array is a linear array from input to output. So connections are made through these switches. So this is the first cell in the array, the second in the array. The next cell is bypassed by putting these two switches in the cross state. This now is the third cell in the array and the fourth and out. Okay, so by appropriately setting the state of these switches, I'm able to bypass uh, one unit. Of course, uh, if I have more spares, I can bypass two units. Those two units cannot be consecutive because, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I take that back. They, they can be consecutive. So for example, if I want to bypass this um, P2, I will go, this will be crossed, this will be bent, this will be crossed, and then I'll go there. Okay, so if I want to model the reliability of the system, or yield in the case of defect tolerance, uh, this unit can tolerate defect, can be circumvented, uh, one defect in one of these processors can be circumvented. But defects in the switches cannot be circumvented. The switches must be all OK. So in terms of reliability modeling, I have a 4 out of 5 system here in series with this system of switches. Now, switches are typically much less complex in terms of hardware than processors. So it, you know, the reliability will not be too low, even though the switches are the system's hard core and should be functional in order for the system to work. Okay, one way to avoid having the switches as part of the hard core, therefore reducing reliability or yield, is to do distributed switching. So this is the same array, except that uh, I don't have these switches. I have multiplexers inside each of these that allow this unit, um, this is spare, of course, like this one, this unit to take its input from this P0 or from the primary input. So even if a unit is defective, the good unit can reconfigure themselves by putting these MOXs in appropriate states and be able to establish this pad that you see, the heavy, heavy line. And then you need a MOX at the end because the primary output can come from this unit or from this unit. So the hard core is, has now reduced, been reduced to just this MOX. Therefore, and less uh, effect on reliability or yield. So this is known as distributed reconfiguration. This one tolerated one defect. This one tolerates one defect, because if this is defective, then this P2 has the option of taking its input from here. However, whereas this one could tolerate two defects in a row, this one can't, because if, say, these two are both defective, there's no path for this unit to supply the input of this unit. So I have to provide additional connections for that to be feasible. OK, this is the two-dimensional version of that reconfiguration scheme. Again, we have the same kinds of switches. And these switches allow, so if this PB 
its processor P sub B is defective and therefore cannot supply information to this one, we set these switches so that the north neighbor of this PD instead of being PB now becomes PA. Okay, so this is a reconfiguration scheme for two-dimensional uh, processor arrays. And this is the distributed version of the same scheme where I provide the multiplexers for this PD to be able to uh, choose its north neighbor from among PA, PB, and perhaps another unit on this side. And it can choose uh, its west or left neighbor from among PA, PC, and perhaps another unit down here. Okay, again, there is no hardcore here. If, if uh, one of these MOXs is defective or fails, then the effect is that this box is defective. So the effect of switch defects is no more serious than processor defects. More on this later. So this is basically a reconfiguration scheme. Uh, it's an old uh, scheme, but it's still quite interesting. Uh, so here I'm assuming that some processors are defective. So these small circles are defective processors. So there's a spare row at the bottom spare columns uh, three of the units in this spare column are being utilized and four units in this spare row are being utilized to form an array so i built a six by six array one spare row and one spare column but i need only a five by five array and i'm able to extract that five by five array Assuming that these defective processors can be bypassed in the row. So I'm assuming some additional switching capability that allows these bad processors to be bypassed. So here is row 1 with its 5 units, row 2, row 3, row 4, and row 5, and similarly for the columns. Notice that the rows are shifted down in order to circumvent this particular defect. So the row that normally went here has been shifted down and then back up once we have circumvented that defect. It doesn't have to go back up. So for example, this third row, because that row was shifted down, this one must be shifted down also. This one stays down because there's another defect there. And then it goes there. Okay. And this last row has been shifted down for the first four units and then back up there. Okay. So the presence of this redundant row allows me to shift rows down by one place. Of course, if I had two spare rows at the bottom shifting by two places, so for example, after I shifted this down, uh, not there, that's not a good example. Uh, yeah, after I shifted this one to the right, Suppose now this is also defective, so it can't go there. So I can basically go to here if I had two spare columns. So if I have multiple spare rows and multiple spare columns, I can do more shifting and therefore be able to circumvent a larger number of defects. Now, assuming this one spare row and one spare column uh, 
uh, the inventors of this particular reconfiguration scheme notice that as long as you can draw arrows from the spare column or spare row to each of the defective uh, processors without these arrows intersecting, then you are able to reconfigure the system. In this case, I have seven defects, the orange circles, and I'm able to draw these three arrows to these three nodes from the spare column, and these four arrows to these four defective nodes from the spare row, and because these arrows do not intersect, do not overlap, then I should be able to reconfigure the system. And as you see, I was able to reconfigure it. <clears throat> so it's an interesting property. You can quickly check. So the question is, in this case, I was able to circumvent seven defects. The natural question is that what is the worst case situation? is the smallest number of defects that will not allow me to reconfigure and we'll answer this question later okay in chapter eight all right uh, there are some additional topics here that i'm going to skip and therefore i'm going to go to chapter eight yield enhancement so a lot of these uh, Defect circumvention schemes have uh, their roots in efforts to improve the yield of integrated circuits, provide redundant elements on the chip so that uh, if there are defects, we can still use that chip and therefore increase the yield, not have to discard the chip. Of course, the same methods with some changes can be applied for fault tolerance, fault circumvention at higher levels. So these reconfiguration schemes are quite general and can be applied at different levels. And that's why sometimes I say, you know, faulty processors, uh, even though we are talking about defects at this point, because the same methods can be applied for fault tolerance, circumventing faults. Okay, yield models assume defects to be uh, circularly shaped, even though defects are very seldom circular. The thing is for a model does not have to reflect physical reality to be useful. As long as when we run the model, the outcomes, the result of the model match reality, then that's a useful model, even though the physical details do not match the real world. So models are, uh, defects are modeled as circles. And here is a very simple example. It's, it's a trivial example, but it shows uh, even at this you know, simple level that things can be difficult. And uh, if you're not careful, you can commit errors in modeling. So let's say we have a chip that is one centimeter square, on the, so one centimeter by one centimeter, and it is, has nothing but wires that are one micrometer wide. So there are a whole bunch of wires, each of which is one micrometer wide, and there's one micrometer spacing between two wires. Okay, so there will be one million such wires. Of course, this is not a useful chip, it's only wires. But I want to try to model effects on this very simple, non-useful chip. Now let's say that there are an average of 10 random defects per centimeter square. So this is what is known as defect density. There are 10 random defects per centimeter square. So this chip is expected to have 10 defects on average. Now, furthermore, assume that 80% of the defects are small ones, 
of a diameter 0.5 micrometer. And those cannot cause short circuit between these wires. So here I've shown those small defects. Those small defects cannot connect these two wires. So these are extra material defects, I'm assuming. So small defects I can just ignore because they never cause problems. They don't cause short circuit between these wires. Okay, and therefore I can ignore them. 20% uh, of the defects, so two on average, will be for this one centimeter square chip, are large defects of diameter one and a half micrometer. Now, one and a half micrometer is large enough to, of course, if that defect is sits here, it does no damage. But if it sits here, then it will connect. It's very easy to see that th these large defects will cause a problem, will cause short circuit if their centers are within these red critical areas. And those red critical areas constitute one quarter of the area of the chip. So I'm trying to sort of um, uh, walk you through the modeling process for this very simple example. So I've established that I nearly near, only need to worry about two defects on average, given, given this information. And those two defects will cause problems if their centers are in this one quarter of the chip surface that uh, constitute the critical area. Okay, now if one of these defects is just randomly placed on the chip, there is one quarter probability that the center will be in a critical area, and therefore one quarter probability that it will cause a short circuit. Or three quarters probability that it won't cause a problem. Uh, the second defect similarly has three quarters probability that it won't cause a problem. So three quarters times three quarters, nine sixteen. So the two defects have a 9 16th probability of not causing a short circuit, which means there is a 7 16 probability that they do cause a problem. Okay, so you can say that the yield of this integrated circuit will be 9 16th. Okay. So you notice that even with this very simple example and a lot of simplifying assumptions about the shapes of the defects and about just two different sizes, defects are typically many different sizes. Okay, but this gives you the flavor of the model. Of course, if our model is computerized, then we can afford to, we don't have to do manual calculations, then we can afford to take many different defects into account and more complex uh, situations. Now, one of the methods used for yield enhancement is redundancy, but we have to be aware of the fact that redundancy by itself is not sufficient. So in redundancy, you can say, okay, I have N cells that I'm building on a chip and I provide S spares Therefore, as long as n out of the n plus s are defect-free, then I have n defect-free cells to use. Therefore, simple-mindedly, I can model this as n out of n plus s structure. However, it's a non-trivial matter to replace a particular defective cell with one of these spares if they are at different places on the chip. Okay, well, for example, this cell may have been connected maybe to this neighbor and this neighbor. Now, if you replace it with this one, then this one has to be connected to those two neighbors as well. And this is non-trivial to arrange. So it's not just a matter of providing redundant elements on the chip, but interconnects and how actually one of these cells takes over 
for a defective cell is a non-trivial matter. Uh, we'll talk uh, in sections 8.4 and 8.5 about some. So typically what we do, instead of allowing, uh, providing the capability of replacing each of these cells with a random spare, we organize these cells into rows and columns and perhaps replace an entire row. When this cell becomes defective, we replace an entire row rather than that one cell. This makes the reconfiguration a little bit simpler, but it's also wasteful to replace an entire row when there's just one defective element. We'll talk about these in more detail shortly. Now in VLSI floor planning and routing, the impact of defects must be considered. So typically, wider wires are less sensitive to missing material defects. It's harder to disconnect a wide wire if part of, a material, part of the material is missing. On the other hand, narrower wires are less likely to be affected by extra material defect because they, we can provide more spacing between them but they are more likely to be impacted by missing material defect, okay? So there's a trade-off here. You don't want the wires to be too wide or too narrow. So here is basically in graphical form. First of all, here is a missing material defect. To emphasize the fact that these defects are almost never circular. They are very irregular shape. So if I model this missing material defect by a circle, well, that's not an accurate reflection of reality. But again, as I mentioned, if my model provides good predictions about yield, then I will continue using it even though this circular missing material defect is nothing like this actual missing material defect. In this particular example, this missing material defect uh, is not a killer defect. It doesn't basically disconnect this wire. So this is a metal layer. There is still connection here. But that connection is weakened. It acts sort of like a fuse. If high current flows through this wire, this acts like a fuse and may blow. In other words, it may blow this part and this connection may take place. So even though this is not a killer defect at this point, it may develop into a killer defect as a result, for example, of high current in this wire. Okay, so here I've shown extra material defects of the same size. In two cases, when you have wider wires with less spacing, narrower wires with more spacing. You see that the same defect is a killer defect here, and it's not a killer defect. Similarly, missing material defect, again, of the same size. It's a killer defect for this narrow wire. It's not a killer defect for this wider wire. So when laying out VLSI circuits, we have to be aware of these kinds of defects. And the balance, the width of the wire to make sure that uh, we don't have too many killer defects of this kind and too many killer defects of that kind. So here's an example. It's a small section of an actual VLSI layout. So these are a bunch of uh, uh, metal wires. The blue ones are on one layer and the red ones are on the different layers. And these uh, boxes are vias. So this blue line goes here, goes down the via, and goes to connects to that wire. Now, if I have extra material defects of this size, and that size is here, it causes no problem. Okay, if it's here, it causes no problem. Extra material. Okay. However. If the center of that circle is in one of these small rectangles shown here, 
then it provides short circuit between this blue wire and this blue wire. If the circle is if the center of the circle is there, then the circle is large enough to <coughs> short circuit these two. <coughs> so the probability of this happening is basically the probability of having a defect of this size times the probability of the center of that defect to be in one of these areas. So if the defects are randomly, we assume they're randomly distributed, then the probability of the center uh, being in the, one of these areas is the sum of those areas divided by the sum of the, the whole layout. So it's a very small probability. So if this defect has a high probability, when multiplied by that small probability of the defect being a killer defect, the probability will be small. On the other hand, for these large defects, the critical area is quite large. All these gray areas are critical. The center being in any of those areas will cause bridging between these adjacent wires. Okay, so the probability of this killer being, and this defect being a killer defect is large. The sum of these gray areas divided by the total layout area, in this example, it's maybe 50%. But fortunately, these large defects are rarer. They have the small probability. So even though for each such defect, the probability is high, that it is a killer defect, the probability of the defect itself is small. Okay, so we model this uh, okay, I'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so we basically have to have a re probability distributions for defects of various sizes. And then once we have that, it's pretty easy to find out all the critical areas for each defect size. Remember, defects are not circular. We'll take them to be circular to simplify this analysis. Because we have no idea what the shape of the defect is. So this is just as good as any other shape. <clears throat> OK, to improve memory yield, I mentioned that we provide spare rows and spare columns. Here is a toy example, simple example. Uh, we have a six by six memory array, the yellow cells, some of which are defective, the red cells. Okay, this is an exaggerated example. But we usually don't have this many defects in such a small memory. But this is just an example. We also have two spare rows and two spare columns. And we want to be able to circumvent these defects. This is an allocation problem that happens to be MP complete in the general case. OK, so here is my solution to this problem replace this defect by replacing this row, replace these two defects by replacing this row. So I'm using two rows. And then replace this defect by replacing the column, and replace these three defects by replacing that whole column. I do have two extra columns and two extra rows. And those two rows and two columns collectively cover all of the defects. So the problem is finding the covering for the defect using the resources that we have. This can be turned into a mathematical, a graph problem, in the following way. Uh, construct a bipartite graph with nodes on one side being the rows of the memory array, and nodes on the other side being the columns. So in this case, I have six rows and six columns. 
connects a row to a column if there's a defective cell. So row zero is connected to column two because there's a defect in row zero, column two. So these connections in the bipartite graph represent the defect. Now, because I have two spare rows and two spare columns, I have to choose two rows, two of these nodes, and two of these nodes, so that collectively they touch all of those edges. They cover all of those edges. Okay, previously I said that C2 and C4, C2 and C4, they touch these four edges, R3 and R5, and therefore all the edges are touched by these selected nodes. Therefore, rows 3 and 5 and columns uh, 2 and 4 are the ones that should be replaced with spares. Okay, of course, if we have random defects, then I have two rows and two columns. I'm guaranteed to be able to circumvent any four defects because in the worst case, the four defects will be in different rows and different columns. Therefore, I have to assign one row or one column to each defect. But up to four random defects are guaranteed to be circumventable tolerable okay however defect tends to cluster in columns and rows and therefore because of that clustering i typically can circumvent uh, many more defects okay now uh, this uh, linear processor array I showed you before. If I'm worried about those switches uh, becoming uh, a problem so that defect in switches basically causes low yield, I have the option of making the switches redundant. This is one possible scheme. Uh, So in this scheme, uh, I have two rows of switches so that if one of these switches is defective and I can't set it in the proper state that I want, I can avoid that altogether by going around it. So here you see that uh, zero, the pad goes here one, and then I avoid that bad switch by going to this row of switches and simply get to the other side. Now here, uh, if I can tolerate one of these modules being defective, so in this case, it will be a three out of four system. I can also tolerate one of the switches being defective. So given that I have 10 switches, this will become a nine out of 10. Any 9 out of 10 working, I'm guaranteed to be able to reconfigure. So switches are no longer part of the hardcore. Now here is the answer to a question I posed earlier in the lecture. Uh, it takes only three defective processors to disable this reconfiguration scheme. Because remember, I mentioned there should be paths to all the defective modules, either from the spare column or from the spare row. If I have this arrangement of three defective nodes, then I can't get to that node either through the row or through the column. Therefore, so at best, I can say in the, in the worst case, 
this can circumvent two defects. If I'm unlucky, three defects would disable it. Of course, as I, as we saw before, five, seven defects may also be circumventable if I'm lucky. But in the worst case, three defects. So two is basically the maximum I can count on. So in reliability modeling, if this is an M by M array, I will model it as M squared minus two out of M squared system. So as long as M squared minus two of those blocks, modules are okay, then I'm guaranteed to be able to circumvent the defect. Um, however, this is highly pessimistic and it's sort of, uh, you know, always when we do reliability analysis, we establish lower bounds. And those lower bounds, of course, the closer they are to actual reliability, the better. But sometimes the lower bound will be much, much lower than the actual reliability. And we have to live with that because uh, there are limitations to models. Of course, we can go the route of more complex modeling that takes all combinations of defects into account, assigns a probability to each, and then whether or not that particular combination is circumventable or not, we can compute the more precise lower bound for the reliability. But that's a lot more work. Okay, at the edge of this array, when there are say five in external row connections, I have to be able to connect the row connection either to the original rows or to one row down. And the mechanism that allows me to do that are called is called shift switching. So a shift switch it allows a signal either go straight through or to be shifted down. This is a more elaborate shift switch. It's basically a demultiplexer. And this is three-way shift switcher that allows the signal to go through, to be shifted up, and to be shifted down, whichever we choose. And that would be useful, I forgot to mention, if I decide to provide uh, so I said I have a spare row here and a spare column here. Nothing stops me to provide a spare row at the top and a spare column at the left. More redundancy, therefore more tolerance. And now rows can be shifted downwards towards this spare or they can be shifted upwards towards this spare, rightwards towards this spare column or leftward. So there's a lot more flexibility, and in particular, this pattern now becomes tolerable because I can get to this, the arrow to this can go through the spare row at the top. I leave it up to you to establish the worst case pattern, the smallest number of defects that would disable that scheme with uh, spare rows at the bottom and at the top and spare columns on the left and on the right. Okay, often we use multiple redundancy schemes in order to take advantage of the strengths of each method. And the classic example of this, this is an old chip built by IBM where they used error correcting codes and spare rows of rows and columns in order to circumvent defects. So if you had just occasional isolated defects, error correcting code by itself would be sufficient because one defective cell in the world, if a single error correcting code, then one defect will basically, the effect of one defect will be corrected by the error correcting code. Okay, however, if uh, defects are clustered, then error correcting code is not good, but spare rows and columns are good. So the conclusion of this study was that if you used error correcting codes only, the average number of failing cells per chip, okay, could be as small as 1,000 
before the yield would drop to unacceptable level if you use error correcting cortisol. If you use spare only, spares only, then you need even fewer defects because the number of spare rows and columns is limited. Maybe you have, uh, I don't know, four of each. So eight random defects can use up all the capabilities of those spares. And the ninth random defect basically disables. But if you use both of these, then experiments showed that you need a lot more. So even up to 2,000 defects per cell, the yield is still quite acceptable. It's around 90%. Okay, so the lesson here is that multiple uh, schemes are often useful because each one has its own strengths and when combined together, uh, they can provide high benefits. Of course, the downside of that is that each scheme also has weaknesses, so you have to be careful when you when you uh, combine different schemes together. Okay, this section I'm gonna skip. Um, I just realized that for some reason, a very important slide I may have skipped inadvertently. So let me go back. Fortunately, I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, but maybe inadvertently I deleted that slide. Uh, okay, so let me stop at this point, uh, and uh, there is uh, this final slide that I needed to show you. Uh, this is basically looking back and looking forward. Uh, we have finished our examination of this state, defective state, how to deal with defects. And in particular, we talked about burn-in burn testing that exposes latent defects, and basically turns them into faults. So even though we really try to focus on these upward transitions that make the situation better. Sometimes we purposely put the system through these downward transitions because a fault is more readily observable than a defect. An error is more readily observable than a fault and so on. So we put the system through this transition by burning testing. We test it under extreme conditions so that defects manifest themselves as faults, and then we can detect their presence uh, using fault testing methods, which is the subject we'll cover next time. Similarly, at the fault level, fault testing basically has the objective of turning faults into errors so that we can observe the errors at the output of the circuit and deduce that there was a fault, okay? So these downward transitions, even though they're undesirable, sometimes they're helpful to us in exposing defects or faults. Okay, so next time we'll talk about the fault level, both uh, uh, fault detection and testing, designed for testability, and fault tolerance which is the counterpart of defect circumvention that we covered today. All right, uh, thank you and stay safe until the next lecture.